Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, this is the third interview in our video interview series. Uh, and today we have a very special guest again. His name is Anuvind, and he has uh, done his MIM from EdHec Business Schools, one of the top schools in France. And currently he's working with Estee Lauder, another top company when it comes to the luxury, uh, luxury segment. So one of the favorite quotes that Anuvind says is basically he's a fan of globalization, that he's an Indian who's working in France for an American company. So I won't say much more, but uh, let's start hearing it from uh, Anuvind himself. Hi Anuvind, welcome so much. Uh, welcome. Hi Piyush. Uh, to the interview. Could you tell us a bit about uh, yourself and your journey that has been so far uh, when it comes to uh, going to MIM and being in France? Um, um, first of all, thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Piyush. Um, really appreciate it. Um, uh, going forward to the journey, I, I, I could well say it has been a roller coaster ride. Um, if you would have asked me three or four years ago that would I see myself working in Paris, uh, you know, one of the fashion capitals of the world, um, and, and be here where I am, I would have, uh, I would have, I would have doubted myself. Uh, but overall, it was a, it was a very roller coaster ride. Um, I started off uh, I started off giving my GMAT like so many other uh, business school aspirants in India and around the world. I took my GMAT for the first time. Uh, didn't plan out as I expected. Uh, it was my first time. I was not really serious. I, I gave it again, and uh, uh, that was kind of the score which I was looking for. And um, that was also the score which I used to target to top schools here in France and and around Europe. Um, one of the reasons I chose France was because I, I got a good enough scholarship here to study at EDEC based on my GMAT score and my profile from before. And um, henceforth, I chose uh, EDEC Business School, which is ranked uh, pretty much in the top 10, top 20 when it comes to uh, masters in management around the world. Um, I also studied here for because for one of the reasons being like, it's, it's a very global place, you know, like back home when we are in India, we have a very, we, it, it's a great place to work in India as well, but it's a very localized atmosphere and most of our colleagues and most of our people around us are co-workers, they are Indians. We don't get that global aspect of how the economy works and how the things work in other parts of the world. But here in France, especially here in France, where in my class, I had people from around 20 plus nationalities and now in my company, I have 50 plus nationalities. Uh, I get really the sense of the, the atmosphere and the, so many cultures intermingling and so much diversity in these individuals. So I think that is, is a pretty cool thing. But like, yeah, I, I did my uh, master's uh, from EDEC. I, I did an internship, which so many other people also have to do because landing a job in Europe is not really a piece of cake, as you would have known. You really have to go through the end of uh, studies internship and then you look to, look to get into a job. So that has been uh, my last three years in Chile. That's, that's uh, very nice. And thank you for mentioning, uh, mentioning so many points which are very, very useful for the candidates. Uh, landing a job is not very uh, easy, but then if you, if you continue and try, uh, if you keep trying with uh, conviction, basically you do find very nice jobs and work in international companies such as Estee Lauder. Uh, so uh, the first question uh, that we have is basically, uh, you went for an MBA, uh, MIM. So why did you actually go for an MIM? Because uh, in your profile, you have done a BTEC and then you have done an MBA. And then you decided to go for a master's in management in Europe. So what was the thought process here that you followed? Um, uh, I'll be honest with you, like, there, there, are, there are two clear distinctions between people who do an MIM and people who do an MBA. Uh, one of them is being the work experience. Um, so usually if you want to get into a top five, top 10, top 20 business school around the world for an MBA, you need to have like five plus years of work experience, which, you know, as, as a young person of 22 years old, I did not have unless uh, I was working uh, from way before. So that was one of the reasons that shifted me more towards uh, master's in management because uh, it is something that uh, you could do just after graduation because it just adds an added layer of specialization like in my case it was marketing uh, it just adds an added layer of specialization into what you want to do and uh, the other reason with which I chose for MIM uh, was being uh, it was again a very comprehensive program 
um, it was a program where you had uh, so much about the coursework and so much about the practicalities as well. When I when I looked into videos and I talked to the alumnus of the schools, I got to know that it's uh, it's a very global program. You have so many people around you to do the group works and projects, and that is something that was that was something which I really wanted to do for a, for a long long time. I did my I did my dual degree uh, back home in India, but after that I wanted to make a step ahead in my in my second masters, and that is the reason I chose MIM. All right. Okay. Uh, so that's, uh, that's super nice. Uh, so when you prepared for your uh, MIM courses, you said that you gave GMAT twice. So the first time you did not give any, uh, you, you did not get your desired score and the second time you actually got it. So was there any other issues that you faced uh, while you were preparing for your MIM journey or uh, how did you basically go about solving them apart from GMAT or even in GMAT if you have any tips? I think I would I would really say that GMAT is just one part of the whole application. Like GMAT will not decide or make or break your application. I'll be very honest with you. GMAT is just a small part of like I would say it's around thirty percent or forty percent maximum of your overall application. But what matters even more is is how you do the interview. Like you always, if you go to a top school, you always have a face to face interview. Usually um, they have some delegates in your city in the country where you do the interview. But in my case, my interview was over Skype. I had a couple of interviews like those. Um, and uh, apart from that, there is the essays. And I think you really need to focus on your essays because that is something that is going to maybe make or break your application because a bad essay won't take you far away in the application journey. And uh, apart from that, there is also this criteria about profile. So most of these top schools, they, they are into diversification. They don't want all the engineers. Like, you know, in, in India, you have IMs and all the IMs, like most of the people, they're engineers, like 90%, 95%. But in these schools, they don't want all the engineers or all the art majors or all the political science majors to, to take part. They want a very diverse group of audience. So I think that is something which also matters, like what you have done in past, how your experiences have been. They also take into account that and they say, okay, this person is going to bring this perspective of his uh, experience into the class discussions or the group projects. And that is also very important. thing. This is something you can't really control, I would say. But a better experience, let's say if you are an engineer, you're a really good engineer, you are into artificial intelligence. They know that you could be a good asset when it comes to AI or machine learning discussions in the class. And these are also some things that matter. So GMAT plus essays plus the interviews and plus your overall package that you bring is something that uh, is a big part of the overall college application. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that is also something that I tell uh, a lot of candidates, a lot of aspirating, uh, aspiring candidates that uh, that developing your profile is one of the most uh, important parts. It's, uh, it's not only about focusing on the GMAT score, of course, a good GMAT score helps you a lot, but it's not the sole criteria. If you get an 800 in GMAT, that does not mean that you'll get uh, acceptance calls from all these schools. So you need to really have a very, very strong profile. You need to have your story in order so that uh, schools can actually invest in you. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, just to add to that, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but like, just yeah. I, I just got an example recently. Uh, one of my really good friends, uh, he gave GMAT recently and um, he had some work and all, but his GMAT score was in mid 650s. Uh, but another friend who had a GMAT in above 700, 720. Um, one of them got into HSA and the other one did not. And the one who got was the one into uh, whose GMAT score was mid 650s because he had the better overall package he was bringing to the yeah. to the class as compared to someone who had 700 but didn't have that experience that he could bring. So it, it, GMAT is just one part. If you get a good score, well done. But focus on the overall application. Don't get your head turned around over it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, a very quick follow-up to this question is basically which colleges did you apply to when you applied for MIM? Did you only apply to EDEC uh, or did you apply to all the SAI schools or did you apply to other schools? And what actually made you choose EDEC over others? Um, so I applied to a couple of schools. I, I think in France, I applied to three of them and I got into two. So I applied into um, HSA, I applied into uh, ESCP, I applied into EDEC. I did not, I could not apply to ESSEC because I think I missed the deadlines and uh, that was one of the reasons I could not apply. But like uh, of these three, I got into two of them. I got into ESCP and I got into EDEC. And the reason I chose uh, EDEC was uh, because um, they, give, they offered me a 
good enough scholarship, which was uh, something I needed because I'm from a, I come from a middle class, uh, working class family in India. And I needed that kind of like a financial cushion, which I could, which I could have. So that was one of the reasons to choose EDEC. And the other reason to choose EDEC was also, uh, when I look into account, like this is also something that students should know, like when they go to a new country or a new city, they should also look into account, apart from the tuition cost, the cost of living in that city. So for example, if you, if you study in ESCP uh, Paris, you will be overall spending much more as compared to I who studied at EDEC Lille, where Lille, the cost of living is not that high. It's, it's like you can survive in 500, 600 euros a month, but in Paris, anything less than 1,000, uh, you're still very dicey. And that is also one of the reasons because I didn't want to like overburden my, my parents and my financial support, which I was getting from them. And I really wanted to make it work. And that was one of the reasons I also chose EDEC because it was located in a tier two French city where the cost of living was not that high, but the school was still relatively ranked higher. So it was one of the key reasons. But that, that is a very, very logical and a very sound way of actually choosing the schools because when you're looking at the costs, it's not only the tuition costs, as you said, it's also about the, uh, the, the living costs because living costs, usually people don't think of it too much. But then if you look at the living costs for the next two years, then it adds up and it becomes quite a significant chunk of, of the actual uh, spending that you have to do. So that is absolutely amazing. And, and, uh, stu yeah. and uh, studying at EDEC has not you know, has not been fruitless for you. It has been very fruitful. Now you're working at Estelado, one of the biggest companies uh, when it comes to luxury cosmetics. Uh, so how has you, your experience been since graduating from EDEC? And how was the, you know, what sort of support did you get from EDEC in terms of career services? Uh, or uh, how has your experience been in terms of finding a job in France? How much French do you speak? How, how much French do you speak? So that also, uh, if you could answer these questions. Um, um, apart from that, um, so I speak a little French. Um, I, I used to speak French when I when I came here, but it was not uh, good enough for the professional life. I'll be very honest with you. I'm, I'm still learning. I would say I would still consider myself a, 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 a learner. But at the same time, uh, when, I, when I was started looking for jobs, I spoke almost no French. So that was one of the negative things that I had and uh, in my overall profile. So that is something I would advise if you come to a country, learn the language. That is the first thing you should do because it will exponentially increase your odds of landing a good, decent job, like exponentially. In my case, uh, I was limited to options of uh, very global companies who had their international headquarters in and around France and Europe. So Estee Lauder has its European headquarters in Paris. So that was uh, one of the things which, uh, which, which, I, which I got to know. Um, and, and, and finding a job in France, I would not say it's very difficult, but I would also not say it's a piece of cake. Like it's not something, it's just lying over there and you can just go and grab it, you know? Um, because overall, in Europe, the job market is, uh, is, 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 is good, but at the same time, it's regulated very, very, very thoroughly. For example, they don't have a higher and far kind of tradition that you have in United States or even in India, because in India, I know like so many people who, who were hired even by companies like Amazon and Google. And after one month, they were fired. Like you can't really do that in Europe, like because of how the things are regulated. So that's why the companies need to be, need to be like hundred percent sure on your abilities and only then they, they promise you promise you employment and so that is one of the things but at the same time it's it's good for the employees because they have job security you do you that thing that you will lose your job every day will not be running into your mind and because here the system supports you even if you even if you quit from a job or you lose your job the social security will support you and you won't be lying on the roads and uh, 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 asking for bread every day so that is a good thing about working in europe but Overall, like looking for a job, I think my school did support me very well. Uh, but in Europe, they don't spoon feed you. They don't say, hey, these are the five companies. They will give one of them will give you a job. There is no spoon feeding kind of like the culture here. The culture is really take the arrow, take the bow, go and hunt yourself. And that is something which actually is a really good thing because, you know, in India, you are spoon fed every job. And that's why people don't build that kind of a personality about hunting for things. They think, okay, I got this. I got a, I got a job at Amazon. Even though if you went to like one of the IITs or IMs, you got a job at Amazon or I don't know what you, you still don't have that feeling of, you know, hunting for it, but here you develop that feeling. You get support from your college about interviews and other things around it. You get some 
support from the alumnus. So in our case, I, I got a lot of support from the alumnus who told me about where to apply and how to apply. But overall, it's about how you do it and not about how someone refers you or does things. So I think that is uh, something that builds your personality a lot and uh, you become really strong at doing kind of those kind of things. But usually like after you graduate in Europe, you do an internship, like you have to do a six months internship and then they, they go forward to looking for jobs and other things because the internship is like your trial or probation period where you are tested by the potential employer and where they see if you have the necessary skills for the ongoing job. So yeah, that's it. Yeah. All right. That's, that's amazing. Uh, that's amazing insights again. So it, it kind of brings uh, back memories from my own time when I was looking for a job in Europe, it was difficult. It was very difficult, especially without knowing the local languages. Uh, it gets very dicey in terms of approaching employers and, and asking them for referrals or approaching network connections and then asking for, uh, asking for referrals. But it, but if you remain at it, if you, keep working at it and if you keep pushing towards it then you definitely get to it so again uh, amazing pieces of advice i think i would i would just like to add one one last thing uh, over here um, i'm sorry it's not like a lot of people ask me like what gets you like uh, settle down what gets you uh, like going for a job i would not say it's really motivation because motivation is more of an emotion i would say it's discipline like you have to be disciplined you have to just sit around the, on the computer you have to go around making networking you have to do those things and this is not something that motivation can bring you this is what discipline brings you and you have to be disciplined to get uh, or let say perseverance that like this is the feeling that actually gets your job in the long term yeah and this was also one of the features in our last interview uh, with uh, with Nikhil Jain he's in uh, he's a graduate from Essex Business School and uh, one of the things that he said was basically that he would wake up he would see 15 rejections and then he would just go by just leave that and then start applying again for other 15 companies so and he's in Paris yeah. so maybe you should you guys should meet up as well that would be nice uh, mm. Definitely. So uh, one thing that you touched upon here was, was the realistic part of uh, how, how the experience goes when you go to Europe to study, the realistic part of the, uh, uh, of the journey. That is, uh, instead of going just through all the, you know, the gaga stories of people or the people who tell uh, about the wonderland stories that everything, once you just need to get to Europe and then your life is sorted, that is absolutely not true. And uh, you, you recently had something like this on LinkedIn as well with somebody else. So uh, if, if we talk about realistic expectations uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of finding a job in, in France or in terms of uh, what should these students expect when they come to Europe or to France in particular, uh, in terms of uh, education culture or in terms of finding a job or in terms of how easy it would be to live a life in France, could you shed some light on that? I would say it's going to be like three points. Like uh, <laughs> the first one for finding a job is like start early. Like the moment you the moment you come here, you should be the you should be going out and networking with the alumnus, networking with so many partners because you know most of the top business school, um, SA, Eric, HSA, whatever, they have partner companies and for specific projects. I'm sure in your case also you had some partner companies. It's really important that when you work on those projects with these partner companies, you make contacts. You, you, you see a new person and you think that's going to be useful, add them on LinkedIn. Um, uh, just, just go around and asking for things because these are the things which really help you in the long run because networking really goes a long way. The second thing is try to learn some local language before you come to France or if it's Germany, German, France, it's French, uh, in Netherlands, Dutch, try to learn some language before you come because you would still survive here, but you would not live properly if you don't speak the language. And that is something if you have to live properly, really enjoy the, the small, uh, small parts of everyday life. Like for example, the other day, like I was going and um, like I, I, now I speak some French. I, I, I understand almost every French, but I, I have problem in speaking. But the other day when I was going, um, uh, I saw on metro station there was there was a there was a there was a clash happening between two people and I, I I understood some of them and it was really funny because if you don't understand that language see all the drama you are going to miss out on because you know Paris is full of drama as like any big city in the world and you don't want to miss on that you know small drama it's it's funny to just go around and watch people do their everyday life and that is the second thing and the third thing which I would really uh, advise people is like be disciplined because. Because some people, when they come to Europe, as you said, 
they think of it as an over over budgeted euro trip they go around in going to these fancy places in portugal and capri coast in italy but they never go around looking for jobs you know because at the end of the day they will they will come and like one month before the end of the semester they would be like oh damn i don't have a job yeah because you were in capri coast a week ago how could you have a job when you are in capri coast and that is something which i which i which i feel like a lot of people take it for granted like you are here you are in one of the most beautiful continents in the world and i know that you want to go around and travel i love traveling i i, I whenever i get time i do travel but i don't do that at the expense of hunting for jobs or i don't do that at the expense of doing my projects do your projects work hard and play harder that's the that's the philosophy that's going to work for you in europe if you do work hard and you do play harder it's good for you but if you only keep on playing harder and uh, that's not going to be the best thing you could do so these are the three things i would advise yeah you know, that that last part about vacationing that uh, you know when I, when i joined uh, when i came to europe i did find a lot of people uh, who actually were there for a two year vacation they were, they were not concerned yeah. about it's an extended euro trip it's like over yeah. budgeted extended uh, yeah. 10000 euros euro trip yeah but but that is also something that the students really need to be very careful about that you know uh, it's not as you said it's not like in india the companies are going to come of course there are career fairs which are organized by the companies and there are a lot of companies which come but the companies don't come with you know a specific number of jobs the companies have come there to present themselves so that you can know that this this company exists and then it's completely up to the candidates to actually go and apply to these companies and find jobs if the companies have jobs which are interesting for them so it's definitely not spoon feeding but uh, the candidates also need to realize this uh so this is this is all very good uh just one last question before we end uh so how are you planning to to go about your future are you are you do you think you will be coming back to india soon or do you think of uh, you, uh or are you thinking that you will continue working in estee lauder and you know stay there for quite a while or maybe even go to estee lauder, uh, lauder headquarters in the in the us or something else um so that that's that's a very fair point and uh, you know as i said like if you had asked me 3 years ago like would i see myself here in these shoes right now i would have said maybe i don't know and similarly i could say maybe i don't know how how the things have been planned for me or how, how i would plan things but what i know for certain is that uh, right now i i have a good enough global exposure i work as i told you like uh, my my job is very global i deal with the so many european affiliates and the global headquarters as well i go around to traveling for business sometimes and and this is something which uh, like someone who is in their 20s uh, like this is something you should cherish until it lasts because this is not going to last forever you're going to have more responsibilities and these things are not going to be as smooth as they are for you when you are in your mid 2020s and uh, so as far as i'm concerned i would really like to right now i'm work in crm analytics i would really like to um, like to broaden my skill set my technical skills as well as my soft skills um, i i know i have come a long way from where i was maybe 2 3 years ago and this is all thanks to living independently and this is what independence teaches you you know if you do it right you get those kind of skills and uh, i know i also have to go a long way after this as well and so i would really like to broaden my tech skills as well as my hard skills and soft skills um and this is something i i would love to do like of working for eslodo for some time and then going up the you know the corporate sphere and this is something that you realize when you work with so many people that how things are going to be planning out so i would love to work here for some time and see like how it goes after like i think i could answer your question well in one more year like give me another year and we can have this conversation again definitely that sounds like a very nice invitation for the next set of uh, interviews that i do next year so you will be invited again definitely sure. and uh, it, it will be a pleasure so thank you very much anuvin it it was a pleasure talking to you and uh, i wish you the best and uh, pleasure, pleasure. Uh,